Well, today I'm talking to Graham Simpson, author of The Rosie Project, which won the Victorian Premier's Literary Award. Manuscript Literary Award, I will get it right. And it has uh, been received with acclaim internationally. Welcome, Graham. Great talking to you, Nelly. So, what led you to write The Rosie Project? Well, um, I decided fairly late in life, I was 50 years old, that uh, I wanted to be a screenwriter. So I'd had a certain amount of encouragement with a vanity film that I'd made, but I knew that I needed to have more, more knowledge, more understanding of it. So I enrolled in a course at RMIT. I needed a project to sustain me, something to work on so that whatever I was learning in class, I could apply to, um, to this project. Um, I knew that good stories come out of character. Um, I wanted a character that perhaps other people in the screenwriting course wouldn't be so familiar with. Um, and I basically chose a geek. Um, I've got a background in information technology, I studied physics, I did a PhD at university in the science faculty. So I met an awful lot of socially awkward but very smart guys. Um, we see them in films all the time but we don't see them from the inside. We don't see them as a protagonist. Mm -hmm. So uh, I invented this character Don Tillman um, and a story that eventually became The Rosie Project that I worked on over five years uh, while I was enrolled in the screenwriting program. Don Tillman is um, supposed to be on the autism spectrum, or the implication is that he's on the autism spectrum. Well, well let, let's spectrum. do that one, because that, that's probably the hub of what, the nub of what we want to talk about, I guess, yeah. the, this whole autism thing and how it's portrayed. Yeah. So, um, I drew originally um, on people that I had met. No individual in particular, but mm -hmm. a range of people who behaved, spoke, thought a certain way. I didn't count myself amongst them, but I counted them amongst my friends, my colleagues, mm -hmm. you know, good friends and colleagues. Um, none of them, to my knowledge, um, have ever been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome or being on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. Partly, I'm sure, because uh, historically, that just wasn't around at the time yeah. that these people were young. Um, and they got through life. You know, by definition, they were people who had jobs, friends being me or whatever. So they'd managed through life without going to seek any sort of diagnosis. Mm. Doubtless, in retrospect, many of them were on the autism spectrum. Mm. But I didn't know that at the time. And it was after I wrote my first sort of workup story about Don Tillman to take to class, I showed it to someone, a friend of mine, to review it before I took it to class. And he said, oh yeah, story about a guy with Asperger's. I thought, I guess. And I took it to class and said, this is a story about a man with Asperger's syndrome. And I immediately got my first taste of what it would be like to actually put forward a character who explicitly had Asperger's syndrome. All anybody wanted to talk about was Asperger's. They weren't, in, you know, far less interested in my person as an individual, far more interested in the manifestations of Asperger's. Like, does this guy wear socks? You know, I've heard that people with Asperger's don't wear socks. And would he really be going out on a date? Surely someone with Asperger's would rather stay at home and play with the Xbox, and so on and so forth. So all of a sudden he stopped being a person. He stopped being a person. And became a problem. And exactly. He became a set of symptoms. Not even a problem per se, but fascinating because of Asperger's, mm. not fascinating because of his, his complete, his wholeness as a person. So nobody wanted to talk about him being a genetics professor. In fact, he was a physics professor at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to talk about that. All they wanted to talk about were these manifestations of Asperger's. Um, and at the end of that class, um, my teacher said to me, it's obvious, Graham, you need to do a lot more research on Asperger's if you're going to write this character. And, and my conclusion was just never put that label on the character again. Mm -hmm. Now, and so in, the, in both books, in both The Rosie Project and The Rosie Effect, mm -hmm. I deliberately have scenes where the topic of Asperger's is raised. Well, the opening chapter of The Rosie Project. Yeah. I mean, that, that completely, in fact, I'm not sure where the chapter ends and where the, the scene with the kids in the classroom ends, but that just totally grabbed me. It was such an unusual way to look at it. It was so engaging. It was... It really showed a different angle to the whole autism thing. Well, well for me, that was um, that's the most important um, scene in the, in the entire book from a writer's point of view, mm. because it's early on and it's got to do a lot of work. Mm. It's actually setting up our character and it's mm. setting up both his strengths and his weaknesses, yeah. his, uh, his lack of a filter and, and what it leads to. He calls the woman at the back of the room you know, fat and then corrects it to overweight and something like <laughs> But, but then we see that he actually is doing something for these kids. He's giving them yeah. some, some encouragement. Um, and he's I, validating them. He's validating them. And then we see what the 
you know, what the um, the establishment thinks of, of Don being a, a truth teller, if you like. You can't say that. Yeah. That was very definitely the message that was coming through, even though the children were creatively problem solving mm. in a situation that was safe. Yeah, and look, and it starts. It, the thing for me, if you want to ask about, you know, if we talk about the question of how Asperger's is treated in the book, mm. a lot of it comes back to, are we talking about a disability slash disease, whatever you want to call it, you know, uh, for which you would seek a cure? In other words, if we could change Don Tillman to be a neurotypical, would we choose to do it? Would he choose that? And if we could stop people like Don Tillman being born, would we choose to do that? Now, what you get, because we now have incorporated Asperger's into this autism spectrum, mm -hmm. the difficulty you have is that one end of the spectrum, you've got people who are just a bit different. Right. But, but often that difference can be a creative positive. They, they, they may be better at certain things and that may take us forward with disease cures, all sorts of things, discoveries in physics. And then at the other end... Their difference can help them be more focused. It can. And maybe think a little bit more laterally. Well, just in the way that any difference, if, some, if a difference means that someone is better at some things mm. and worse at others, mm. then that's going to have those trade-offs. Yeah. And sometimes we accept somebody or we value somebody for what mm. they're good at and mm. are prepared to overlook their, their weaknesses or give them help to overcome them, but, but the fundamental value is around what their strengths are. Mm -hmm. But you get to a point in the autism spectrum where the person is, is quite patently, severely disabled, mm -hmm. unable to look after themselves in the most basic of ways and mm -hmm. so on. And Don says in the, um, in the Rosie Effect, the line that's been most quoted so far, he says, a world of Don Tillman's would be efficient, safe and pleasant for all of us. <laughs> and he's saying yeah, the, the problem is other people, if you like. Whereas if you're talking, and, but he says, but a world of rain men would be dysfunctional. And even in the autism community, well, not just even, in the autism community, um, I believe there are divisions amongst those at one end who would say, we're looking for a cure for autism, mm -hmm. and those at the other end who are saying, we're looking for acceptance because we're part of a minority. Well, how about both? Well, well quite, quite. Although, I think there's a certain point where people are very, um, very clear that they don't want to be cured in any way, mm -hmm. that if they can give voice to what their desires are, and that's their choice. If there was a cure, it should be their choice. Yeah. Look, it, it's a little like um, how we might have regarded homosexuality not mm. so many years ago. Um, it was it, in the diagnostic statistic manual as a mental illness. As as autism is now, mm. and that you know, and once you once you're now in the past, you might have been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, which was mm. in the DSM manual as well. But now mm. the diagnosis would be autism. And I think someone like Don Tillman might be, having got through life this far without that label, mm -hmm. might not want to be called autistic, mm -hmm. and particularly with the baggage that carries. I mean, on the ABC, I was asked, you know, ABC Breakfast um, Television, I was asked about Asperger's disease. Now, you know, this is, this is the sort of casual stuff that gets out there, mm -hmm. and, and you see why someone like Don um, might choose... Um, not to come out with that. Now, I mean, for example, a lot of people have asked me, I met with Bill Gates recently, have asked me, so is, does he have Asperger's? And, and my, my answer is, I can't diagnose Asperger's at 30 paces. Sitting down with Bill Gates was like sitting down with a lot of guys I've worked with in information technology. Mm -hmm. We talked about, not each other particularly, but about something, which in this case was the book. Um, but if he did, and I'm in any way suggesting he does, but if he did have Asperger's, it would probably not be helpful for him to declare that, given what his broader mission in life is about philanthropy and so mm -hmm. forth, because there would be prejudice. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, so um, e even in the US, for example, um, when the Rosie Project was um, in, in press, as it were, they said, thank goodness you didn't say he had Asperger's. Mm -hmm. And I said, why? And they said, because the guy who did the Newtown School Massacres had Asperger's, and you know, one guy, one guy, you know, I mean, there's plenty of people out there who've done appalling things. Yeah. One guy has Asperger's, and now there's a link made there. I saw something on social media, I think it was today, where uh, it was a thing captioned with, if John goes and does something bad, then that's John's fault and John's responsibility. If someone who is a Muslim goes and does something bad, then it's Islam's fault. Yep. It's the same thing with... 
a lot of other minorities, well, not that I would even call Muslims a minority, but in the West they might be. Yeah, look, and I think with something like Asperger's, I mean, you might get an argument that says, OK, let's look at these um, at suicide bombings or something like that, looks at the correlation with religious beliefs and so on. Mm. But there's no correlation out there that anybody spotted with Asperger's and violence, no. uh, not to my knowledge at least. Um, mm. So you know, just to say, oh, we had Asperger's, as though that's some sort of explanation in its own right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and then, then you've written The Rosie Effect, which I must admit I haven't read yet, yeah. but then I only read The Rosie Project last week, I think it was. Mm. Um, so so where, where are you going with The Rosie Effect? Okay, um, basically, I wanted... The Rosie Project's a romantic comedy. It's structured yes. as a romantic comedy, which I make no apologies for. I think mm -hmm. that you can structure it's a structure, and you can be as intelligent or as unintelligent um, as you like within that structure. But the second book is not. The second book is exploring an existing established relationship yes. and the challenges of living in, of living in it. Mm -hmm. um, and we get a lot closer to Don, mm -hmm. um, probably at the expense of Rosie to some degree, because yeah. really these books are supposed to be about a portrait of Don Tillman. Yeah. Um, there are a few who like, love the romantic comedy aspect of, of the Rosie Project who would like to see just Don and Rosie getting on wonderfully, but they're, they're people who don't understand that without conflict there's no drama. Yeah. You, you've got to have that. Um, and I was actually wanting to explore something a little deeper than two people falling in love. What does it mean to, to, make, to make a relationship work? And to explore Don's life outside that domestic environment. What are his other friends like? What's his workplace like? Things I couldn't do quite so much in the first book. Yeah. Um, but, so we're able to go a little deeper. I think a lot of people have you know, fallen in love with, with Don, and I wanted to test that a little bit. So early in the book, Don has a meltdown. And you know, I, I struggled a bit with that. There was a point where I wanted to say, Rosie was in no danger. Mm -hmm. But I thought, I thought it was copping out. And I actually gave him some doubts, where he said, you know, what could I say except I got out of that scene? Is, is, you know, my emergency plan worked. I got out of the, the way. But who's to say he wouldn't have been violent? Mm -hmm. And you know. It's a pretty dangerous place to go towards domestic violence, mm -hmm. but um, I guess to be authentic to the character, I have to say you have a meltdown, you're totally, you know, you're almost out of control. Yeah. All sorts of things can happen. Mm -hmm. And subsequent to writing that, I was talking to to a group of people with autism, so actually, you know, high functioning autism, yeah. and you know, one guy was saying, "Look, I've, I've got a black belt in karate." He says, "If I have a meltdown, you know, it's pretty dangerous for anybody around me." So he was quite open that there's, yeah. you know, these things are possible. But we don't. But there's not a great history out there of people with Asperger's you know, doing appalling things. Most times, they you know, if they have a meltdown or whatever, they're able to do something about it. So they have people around them. They have a, they, a plan for. They have a plan. Yeah. You've um, written these two books, and you've finished your screenwriting degree. Yeah, finished the screenwriting degree and the professional writing and editing file. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you've done. You've done a couple. I've, of done, I've done my. I've done my. Paid my dues at RMIT. I've done. <laughs> Which, which is where we are today. Yeah, which, and look, which I found enormously valuable. People yes. say, how valuable was it actually doing some sort of formal study? And I said, well, ask that about any profession, about any creative mm -hmm. activity. And you know, I, I believe that there's value in having a theoretical framework for what you're doing and understanding of what, of what it is you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, There's a discipline of, um, of doing things perhaps that you wouldn't do yourself. Yes. Um, unless you were made to, explore, and getting a little outside your comfort zone, yes. perhaps doing some exercises that are just plain boring, that, you know, just a lot of tedium, mm. to, to the drills as it were, and of course um, working with other people, getting some yeah. feedback. And I, I hear that you're quite a marketing machine, you've gone out and you've, you've gotten interviews, you've, um, well you said you've, you've been travelling in the United States and stuff like that, but some authors talk about um, Different people have different perspectives about how about their degree of responsibility in marketing their book. What's what's it been like for you, and, and what have you done to get your book out there? Well, probably less than you think. Yeah. Um, I've got an excellent publisher, Text Publishing, and mm -hmm. then I've got overseas publishers, yeah. and I've basically said to them. I'm at your disposal, mm -hmm. I'm part of your marketing team, yep. you tell me what you want me to do. I've done very little, I mean this interview is something that's, we've all, I've organised directly, yes. um, but gee that is very, very much in the minority. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it's text saying, you know, please do this radio interview or please turn up at this bookshop or whatever. Mm -hmm. And what I haven't done, which I think a lot of authors do, is say enough already, my six weeks is up, no more thanks. Mm -hmm. and, and look, there's been a, you know, because the book's been pretty successful, um, it feeds on itself. So there's been a continual you know, um, role of um, or feedback going on 
to continue that going. So I've been pretty much on the road since January of last year when the Rosie project was published. That's a long time to be on the road. Well, I got the Rosie effect written at that time as well, so oh, I managed okay. to I managed to find time to write because I used to have a day job. Mm -hmm. and, and what happens is that the publicity side of things takes the place of the day job, mm -hmm. and it's easier. Okay, yeah. So what kinds what kinds of things have you done? I mean, apart from meeting Bill Gates, I mean that must have been pretty awesome. Yeah. Well, there was. I don't want to sort of put it down anyway. It was, look, I was really delighted that Bill Gates liked the book and mm -hmm. went out in public to say so. Yep. Because I think it's a book that, you know, Bill Gates is male, he's mm -hmm. professional, mm -hmm. he's a manager. Yep. These are not the people that Simon & Schuster in the US have been targeting. Um, you know, the cover looks like chick lit and they understand that most of their readers are, are women. Um, and I'm really pleased if you're getting out to that wider range of people. My partner, for example, would say she wouldn't pick up the US copy of the Rosie Project, even though she's a woman. Um, she's a professional woman, she's highly educated, she just says it's not the stuff I read. Um, so taking, taking someone like Bill Gates, uh, picking it up, that, that was the huge positive for me. And you know, I, I enjoyed meeting him, talking about the book, but it wasn't though that the content of that conversation was specially different from what I would have with any other intelligent reader. So what other places have you have you been and um, like have you done all of the talks in like famous bookshops and Yeah, yeah, all over the US. Yeah. All over the US, these iconic bookshops. I, I think if I had to pick one out, it would be the King's English, which is in Salt Lake City, where we braved this this was in December of last year and there's a storm, this absolute snowstorm. We braved the snowstorm and we got there and I think there were fires going in the shop, at least there were heating going on. And what, the shop actual was, fires? I think there might have been, a, my picture is of an open fire now, this may be just my, ro yeah, my romantic picture of it, <laughs> but that's exactly how it felt coming in from the cold, this mm. really warm, welcoming environment when it's a multi-room bookshop and the rooms were full of people. I reckon I signed 300 books that night wow. and it was just such a one, we were drinking wine too in Mormon territory, so it was, yeah, it was great fun. Um, but you know, there's famous bookshops like Parnassus Books, and uh, I can't name them all. And I, I've done a, I think I've been five times now to the States, uh, about the same number of times to the UK. I've done a, a tour of, the, of Germany, which was great fun, out and back in a week, four cities, um, and we were doing readings. So I'd read a bit in English, and a German actor would read some in German, and it's then put on almost like a performance of a play. People go and have an hour and a half of readings. Wow. And tomorrow you're going to be at the Wheeler Centre. Tomorrow I'm at the Wheeler Centre talking about what we were talking about before, about the Asperger's mm -hmm. autism side. And, and I guess I want to talk about whether it's an appropriate um, uh, subject for comedy. Mm -hmm. The New York Times didn't think so. Didn't uh, they? No, look, I, I think um, they probably felt I didn't pull it off more than anything else. Um, but didn't feel that, you know, that Asperger's had, was, was appropriate material. Um, now, of course, that's flying in the face of something like Big Bang Theory, which has been trundling along for a long time on, this, on that premise. Um, and, you know, people make comedy, you know, humour is a reasonably personal thing, mm -hmm. and people will make their own judgments around that. Um, and, but, but, but the ethical question of, is it okay um, to laugh at, with, around Don Tillman? Mm -hmm. um, I guess my, my response to that is number one that Don doesn't see himself as disabled. Mm. So we, you know, we are laughing at differences, but Don would happily engage us in that conversation about he was right, why he was right, and why we were wrong. And it, like the whole thing with the fish. Yeah, yeah, like the, like the whole thing with the fish. I mean, he's handing out a dead fish in class to, 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 as an argument for evolution. He would stand up, that's perfectly reasonable. And, and why wouldn't it be reasonable? The scenes that people like most in the Rosie Project, mm. even more so than the Aspie Kids scene and mm. so, uh, the cocktail party scene, mm. where Don is totally on top of everything. Don is actually showing up other people um, for their, their sluggishness, their lack of memory. He, he picks on the, um, on the doctors who, and gives them a, a reference to a neurology journal and so forth. So he is absolutely swinging, and people love that scene, and they're absolutely, no question, laughing with Don and at the neurotypicals. But the second scene they'd name is Don practicing sex with a skeleton. And, and, and here he is, he's behaving totally inappropriately. But only by social mores. I mean, why wouldn't you? It's a Dean's fault for not knocking. <laughs> so I think a lot of the humour comes, though, not from us laughing at Don being weird, 
but from us laughing at the unexpected. I mean, the, the nature yeah. of, of many jokes is that it's the unexpected, it's the twist. And Don delivers that just because he's looking at the world in a different way. Mm -hmm. And there's a fair bit of observational comedy in there as well from Don's point of view because we're getting Don as the unreliable narrator describing the world. And he's not a million miles away from the observational comedian who's dissecting what we do day to day mm -hmm. as though he or she was the man or woman from Mars. Mm -hmm. And that's Don. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I definitely saw some of the observational comedian, but I was also thinking it's almost harking back to the um, early 20th century comedies of manners. I mean, I'm... No, quite. Quite. Mm -hmm. um, this is, you know, this is an observation of, of, of how of how people interact and how they behave, and mm -hmm. it could just as much be the snobs and the and you know upstairs downstairs type of interactions going mm -hmm. on, um, but with just different dimensions. Yes, we can laugh at ourselves as well as laughing at other people, keeping up appearances. Yeah, it's like how many people while they're laughing at. Hyacinth bouquet. How many people realise that there is a little bit of hyacinth in all of us? And there's a little bit of Don Tillman in mm. all of us. Um, and I think you know, um, one of the things that happened when I when I chose not to make him sort of this this poster boy for autism, or mm. more to the point, this um, this sort of stereotypical representation, this textbook representation, but rather human being who happened to have some of these characteristics, mm. but nevertheless was allowed to have a drinking problem as well. Mm -hmm. you know, so, oh, but you know, I had I had a psychiatrist say to me, um, "You got Don just right, except for the drinking." What do you mean, except Why for the not? drinking? He says, "Well, I don't think Aspies in general drink, and uh, well, it doesn't matter what Aspies in general do. Does any person with Asper Aspergers drink? Because if the answer is yes, then Don's allowed to drink. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to be an average person with Asperger's mm -hmm. syndrome. Um, and you know, the, and when you get to that." Um, you see that he, he acts in some ways that wouldn't be part of, of the book. You know, there are there are things that he does that um, are just you know, the same differences we expect to see amongst other people. In fact, people have said to me, it's like being in Sheldon Cooper's head. Uh, <laughs> now, I've never watched The Big Bang Theory, ever. So, oh. so I think what, what's, what's happening there is that we happen to be on the same territory. Mm. Doubtless Sheldon Cooper has Asperger's. Don has Asperger's. I understand him in the show. I met with the director and he said in the show they never say that Sheldon has Asperger's for much the same reason. But it's implied. But, but and same so, with Arbed in community and everybody loves Arbed. Yeah, that's right. But we are, we, are, we are there in the same territory, therefore we get a lot of overlap. Mm. And if people have never really encountered someone with Asperger's before, then they'll say, oh, Sheldon Cooper's just like Don Tillman. But if you, like me, I guess, have met lots of people, like that, then you're past seeing that similarity. Mm -hmm. You start looking for the differences. You start mm -hmm. seeing them as individual people. And I think we need more people with Asperger's um, in literature, good mm -hmm. people, bad people, Absolutely. dumb people, smart people, so that you see the differences. Yeah, yeah. And I love the fact that you're taking the piss in academia as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's just, yes. <laughs> well, when you look and you say, well, yeah, who are the, who are the, you know, the appropriate people here? Gene who's putting the pins in his map on the wall? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You tell me the dean who's you know who's trying to run the thing as a as a corporation, and you know we have so much of that happening in Australian increasingly in Australian educational institutions these days. Yeah, and you know I look, I wanted to set it somewhere, and I wanted um, you know, not to surround Don with a bunch of normal people. They're just yeah. look, Gene. That would be boring. In my view, Jean might well have been as much of a geek at school and just as much diagnosed with Asperger's as a kid as Don. But Jean is, the, Jean is the, the other side of Don, the person who's worked hard at it. Mm. Um, because, I mean, if you look at the diagnostic criteria in the, um, in the Baron Cohen scale, if you like, which is the one that psychologists use rather than the DSM mm. criteria. See, I have done some research since I wrote the book. Um, <laughs> they're largely, they're largely behavioural things. You know, do you talk so much and people have to shut you up all the time? That sort of stuff. This is, these are behaviours that can be learned mm. and modified. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I would just take Gene as someone who has learned, you know, he may still be wired like Don, but he's learned the tricks, he knows which wine to order. And, and what's he busy doing? Seducing women. Why? He's got something to prove. Yeah. Mm. He, he's the stereotypical guy driving the red sports car in sure. his 50s. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, what, what is coming? 
in the future? Well, I might do a third book in the series, but I'm going to let it uh, let it sit for you know, five to seven years. Mm. Um, I want uh, Don's Don's family to mature a little bit and, mm -hmm. and revisit them down the track. Um, in the meantime, I want to do a couple of other books. Yeah. Um, I don't want to be stereotyped as a guy who can only write Don Tillman. I get a little bit tired of people accidentally calling me Don and, and so on. And then people, people <laughs> literally, people walk up and say, are you Don? Do you have Asperger's? And I think, God, you know, this is exactly the sort of you know, socially inept behaviour you, you would accuse someone with Asperger's of doing. You know, do you have Asperger's? But I'm now public property, so people feel free to ask me those questions. So yeah, I should be enormously flattered that I can write a character so convincing they think it can only have come from me. Mm -hmm. But equally, you'd like to show people that um, you have a broader range in your writing. So I was hugely pleased that at the same time as The Rosie Project came out, I had a short story published in The Age um, because it was runner-up in The Age short story competition, which is very, very different from the, the Rosie Project story. It's a drama. It's you know, uh, not about someone with Asperger's and like that. It's got different sorts of themes. But it's just nice to, to state something out there that says I can do more than one thing. Mm -hmm. So do you have any plans for like genre or uh, plot or something for, yep. for the next book? Yep. Yeah, the, ne the next book's about, um, it's tentatively titled The Candle, and it's about a love affair rekindled after 22 years. Mm. So it's uh, two people meet, carry a torch for each other through their lives, and then re-meet later on, having you know, damaged their lives in many ways because of this. Mm. And they've now got a chance to make amends. So um, it will be the it'll be a mixture of comedy, you know, drama, and uh, I hope it's some insight mm -hmm. um, in different proportions, possibly. Well, I think the best books, personally, the best books have some insight. And a bit of comedy to mm. help carry the serious stuff through. Yeah, it's tough to read a book all the way that never has that lightning mm. amount of comedy. That, and it's a light and shade. And often, you know, with comedy, you can you can tell great truths with comedy, and you can um, you can move people as well. And sometimes laughter opens people up to to a wider range of emotions, and mm. perhaps they're thinking in a different way as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for talking well, today. Thank you, Nalini. Time.